We are creatures of desire. What we most desire is meaning. What makes us suffer most is a lack of meaning. The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. Marital therapist, author, and communications trainer Andrew G. Marshall invites guests from all walks of life to discuss what makes life meaningful. Hello, I'm Andrew G. Marshall. Welcome to The Meaningful Life. My witness today is Josh Cohen, who has two professions, which at first sight seem entirely different. He's Professor of Modern Literary Theory at Goldsmith University of London, and he's also a psychoanalyst. However, Josh has brought these two strands together in a new book, How to Live, What to Do, which looks at the different stages from childhood to old age and uses famous characters from timeless books and his own casebook to illustrate the dilemmas and offer some clues about how to navigate them. Congratulations on a very thought-provoking book. Actually, I've written down various quotes from it to contemplate. Some of them I'm going to contemplate with you and asking you to expand on them. But let's sort of start at the very beginning. How do you think your two jobs fit together? Do they have much in common? I think they do. Um, That's probably because I know the journey that I went through in terms of embracing them both and finding a way to combine them. But I think the common denominator of the two of them is just this deep interest in the inner life, in what happens in the privacy of our own heads and also in the intimacy of our relationships. Poetry and novels are very much about those questions. We're fascinated both by the lives of characters and by the lives of the authors that created them. And we think all the time, consciously or not, about what sort of conditions brought them into being, the conditions in the outside world, but also the specific makeup of the author's psychological life. So it was that in the first place, as part of the standard rubric now for studying literature at university, as you probably know, you sort of look at psychological theories of literature. So you look at Jung and literature, you look at Freud and literature. And I was bitten by that bug very early on as an undergraduate and sort of left it behind in any sustained, serious way, went on to go through the mill of graduate school, master's, PhD, got a job quite soon, quite young. What was interesting for me is that it wasn't a sort of purely reflective, contemplative move into psychotherapy and psychoanalysis. It was much more personal than that. At a certain point, having been through the whole process of training as an academic really very quickly and found a permanent academic position at the age of 25, a few years after that, it's not that I didn't like it. I actually loved and love teaching and I love literature and I love writing about books. But there was something about the settledness of it. There was something about knowing that this was my life. And I was going to be, you know, marking undergraduate essays on The Great Gatsby. Something about that felt a bit like looking down the barrel of a gun, if I'm honest. It just felt like life's questions and dilemmas and possibilities had been closed down a little bit too quickly. And so I had a sort of quite early midlife crisis in my early 30s, and it led me to seek some help. And that's really also what inspired the idea that well, actually, I've always been fascinated by this stuff. Maybe I should find a way to train. And somehow I was lucky enough to be able to do that. Because in a sense, at the very beginning, you actually discovered yourself through books. Your parents went away and they gave you a Peanuts cartoon book. Now, what was it about that book that spoke so strongly to you? And how old were you at the time? I was five at the time. And, you know, my parents just came home from this very rare, I mean, it, it, you know, we were staying with our grandparents, so it was not a traumatic parting by any means. We understood what was going on, but they came back sort of laden with gifts and guilt. and Gifts and guilt. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and there was this sort of, this need to, to make it up very quickly and say, in a way that they were sort of remorse offerings, not that they were particularly needed, but This volume of Peanuts cartoons, it had a big red cover, it had a picture of Charlie Brown looking confused beside a rather furious looking peppermint patty. And I 
sort of enjoyed storybooks. I enjoyed imaginative flights up to that point, but I enjoyed them in a sort of generalized way. I don't think up to that point I'd ever read anything that spoke to the core of me, that sort of recognized me and my singularity. And suddenly there were these kids. I mean, the genius of Schultz, I think, is that he just very subtly tweaks children's language and interactions, gives them a sort of slight adult patina, but basically you recognize them as children with their particular styles of relating, their brutal honesty, their terrible anxiety and insecurity, and their deep confusion and bewilderment in the world. And I found this completely startling, not because I knew anything about what had and hadn't been done in children's literature, but just because I didn't expect to open a book that my parents gave me and see myself really recognized. You know, not just recognized as a kind of, you know, a body to entertain and divert, but as somebody who wanted to be understood and to understand himself a little bit. And there was actually, you know, the analyst is in cartoon as well, wasn't there? Yeah, there was. Yeah, that's right. And what Lucy says to Charlie Brown in that cartoon is that once a child gets to be five years old, his character is pretty well established. And he says, but I am five. I'm more than five. (laughs) And and she says, oh, yeah, that's true. You are, aren't you? Oh, well, too bad. That's the way it goes. And Which is the sort of thing an analyst would say, isn't it? Exactly the sort of thing an analyst would say. And I can't pretend at the age of five that I really got the subtleties and the kind of the nuance, the reference that was at play in this strip. But what it really gave me was a kind of flash of really startled recognition, because this predicament that she was describing, that his character wasn't well established that he didn't really know who he was, that he felt weak and wobbly. I suddenly thought, gosh, yes, I know something about that. I know what it is to feel that way. Do you ever use childhood reading with your clients? Because sometimes I actually ask them to go back to those books they loved as children, to read them again and see what it actually tells them about who they were then and who they are now. Have you ever done that? I haven't done it in terms of directing them to read books because the psychoanalytic method is really always for the patient to lead. So I will always let somebody do that. But I think partly because a lot of the people who come to me know about my other life and partly just because, of course, people read. Books often come into the sessions, and I'm not one of those therapists who will then turn around and say, well, you know, we mustn't get off topic, or we must stay with you and your inner life, and this is all a distraction. I'm interested, really, at that point in what they've brought, in why they've wanted to talk to me about this book rather than another one, about what the character or the poem or whatever it is represents to them. So yes, I mean, I feel like literature and cultural references more generally, film, music in a different way are always coming into the consulting room and you can rely on that. So I I tend not to feel that I need to sort of direct them. And I think when we look back at our childhood favourites, and I would sort of invite our listeners to think about what their childhood favourites were and why they were favourite and what it actually tells them, they seem to fit into two categories. They're either sort of very confirming our picture of the world and it's all very safe or it's sort of unsettling. And Charlie Brown seemed to do both of those for you. Yes, that's right. They showed me a kind of deeper or more layered picture of the world I lived in. Of course, these kids who walked around anxious about their relationships with other kids, that felt to me exactly what it was to live in a neighborhood, to go to a school, to have to negotiate oneself and define oneself in the face of other children day by day. On the other hand, Schultz found this way of naming and describing for us the currents of inner life that I both knew and didn't know. You know, I knew somewhere, almost at a body level, I knew about insecurity because I knew how uncomfortable it could feel to be around other kids, to feel stupid or cowardly or just uncertain and confused. And that was the first time I sort of saw it revealed in words and in pictures. And it gave me back to myself in a way that was both quite strange, but also immensely reassuring. 
And when your parents divorced when you were a child, did you find books were a, a resource that you could retreat into or get something from? Yeah, very much so. And I think that because I was on the cusp of adolescence, so I was 12. And I think what's poignant to think about now is that it was the moment where I started to sort of make the transition into more adult reading. And I think that that was provoked by this sense of, okay, well, now you're having to live in a world of adult realities, which are messy and which are sad and which are painful and angry. I think there was something about the sheer sort of perplexity before how complicated adult life could be that made me think, okay, maybe I'm ready to graduate to, to at least the beginning of, uh, you know, some, take some tentative steps into growing up books. What did you read? Because I must admit, I found the transition from children's books to adult books incredibly difficult. I mean, they now have sort of a whole youth section, but yeah. that just didn't exist when I was that age. No, no, that's right. No, same for me too. There were one or two young adult books, actually, that I was made aware of at the time. The ones that impressed me at the time were by Essie Hinton. I don't know him. She's a, she, actually. She's an American writer who wrote for and about adolescents, and she wrote famous books that were turned into movies called The Outsiders and Rumblefish. Rumblefish was a beautiful black and white movie made by Coppola, starring Mickey Rourke and Matt Dillon and that whole generation. Mm -hmm. And you know, it portrayed a very different world because it portrayed a world of, you know, working class kids in gangs in sort of middle Western towns. But nonetheless, there was something about their lives and particularly their fury. A lot of these kids were trying to deal with the fallout from broken homes. So Hinton was somebody that impressed me, but also I think my first forays were what I would now think of as quite blokish. I think it was much later, a bit later, that I learned to enjoy writing by women. And the books that I remember enjoying at the time were by George Orwell, you know. I read all George Orwell at that period. There's something about well, him that spoke, I think, to the adolescent mind. <laughs> definitely. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. That's exactly. What were the ones you read? Well, basically, I almost walked my way through the catalogue, but particularly the ones of people living desperate lives. Keep the Aspidistra flying would be a good example of that. And I think there was one where he was a teacher in a school and down and out in uh, London and Paris. I mean, he was always these people in a very precarious kind of position. Yes. I, I loved down and out in Paris and London. I think my first was Animal Farm, but that was a bit younger. And I'm not sure how much of the allegory I picked up, but down and out in Paris and Lond London, the idea that, you know, somebody could just go off and be somebody completely different and live a life that was sort of squalid and precarious, but unutterably romantic as well. You know, it, it was sort of instant expansion of imaginative horizons of what was possible in life. I remember being sort of really taken with that book, with Graham Greene, The Third Man, Brighton Rock. And then there was stuff you read at school, Dickens, you know, Copperfield was a book I read early on as well. So one of your suggestions is that we become a little bit more like Alice in the world. This is, of course, Alice in Alice in Wonderland. And this is something I found incredibly interesting, that somehow if we didn't actually exercise our imagination as a child enough, then we're going to have problems as an adult. So let's sort of unpick that idea. First of all, why is Alice so enduring and what has she got to tell us? And then we'll look on how we can use her today. I think that Carol or Dodgson miraculously ventriloquized this little girl, a bit like Schultz, actually. He tweaks it so that she's just a little bit more adult, perhaps, than we'd expect of a girl of seven. But she's nonetheless got all the psychological qualities of a latency child. That is, she loves to play. She loves to take refuge in her own world and create sort of characters like her cat, who in her version of the world can play chess. This is before she falls into Wonderland, into what might well be her dream world. And she has a kind of openness and generosity towards strangeness, towards worlds and ways of thinking and ways of talking that she doesn't know. She doesn't cower in terror before all these strange characters and situations that she meets. 
She's just curious about them. And she isn't phased by the fact that, you know, there's a hookah smoking caterpillar or a talking egg sitting on a wall. She's able to engage in conversation with them as though, you know, these extraordinary, surreal distortions of reality were completely continuous with the world she knows. And what I love most about her is that she doesn't protest the extreme distortions of her ordinary reality, but the little ones, right? This is, after all, what kids do protest about. They don't like small intrusions and interruptions in the continuity of their daily lives. They don't like unexpected surprises like rudeness or like ungenerosity. So that's what she complains about when she meets various figures in Wonderland. She complains that somebody is rude or that somebody is grumpy or that somebody is not talking to her. And that combination of a sort of fussy self-concern of the child, I want things to be just so, but also a kind of expansive generosity, which I think is the thing that we can lose as we go into adulthood. And an acceptance of the strangeness of the world. We sort of want the world to be in a certain way, whereas, let's face it, it's pretty strange, isn't it? Yes, it is, yeah. And I think that we make our way through it much more richly and interestingly if we can respond to that strangeness with an Alice-like curiosity rather than a kind of defendedness which complains that something is wrong because it isn't as I expect it to be, or it isn't continuous with how I think things should be done or said or felt about. And this is one of my quotes from you. Mm. The boundary between reality and illusion is more porous for children than adults. Why is that a problem for adults? We go through various regimens in the course of growing up, the regimens of family life, of school, perhaps of college, of the workplace. And we meet various authority figures who sometimes very benignly and sometimes less so introduce us into routines and rules about how we should conduct ourselves, how our lives should be lived. And the more that these ideas about living are entrenched in us and, if you like, equated with reality itself, the more then we start to see attempts to imagine other ways of living or being as deviations. So we are prone to alienate ourselves from our imaginative lives, which means that when somebody or something comes to us that we don't immediately recognize, that we have to approach and open ourselves to rather than automatically understand it, we foreclose it. We say no to it. And this can be a particularly difficult problem when we're sort of approaching middle age, because we're going to have to almost reimagine our lives because, you know, what worked when we're in the first half of our life is unlikely to work in the second half of our life, isn't it? Very much so. Middle age is one of those tipping points, I think, where we're faced with a kind of existential dilemma, which is, is aging going to be an open up and an expansion of my possibilities? Or is it going to be a kind of melancholy grieving of the loss of my possibilities? In other words, do I associate my possibilities with my youthfulness? with a certain kind of vigor of body, a kind of spontaneity of mind, you know, a capacity to party hard or to stay out late or to burn the candle at both ends. All those sort of qualities of intense energy and vigor that we associate with youth, if we feel those fall away, is that going to be experienced by us purely in terms of loss or is the opening up of something else, of a sort of different orientation to life? which might just be more interesting. Who do you use to illustrate the dilemmas of being middle-aged? I use the character of Clarissa Dalloway in Virginia Woolf's classic modernist novel, This is Dalloway, sort of great stream of consciousness novel, which takes place on a June day in the 1920s. She goes off to buy some flowers for a party, doesn't she? That's pretty much the plot of the book, yeah. 
Yep. It's about the lady who decides she'll go and buy some flowers. But I think most people who read it, if they read it in the right time and place for themselves, actually find this remarkably uneventful book quite riveting. It's riveting because it is about somebody coming to terms with the various losses of youth and what that means for her, which is full of a sense of loss. She grieves her youthful body. She grieves the excitement of particularly sort of relational possibilities, erotic possibilities. You know, there's a young woman who Clarissa was sort of madly in love with and kissed one crazy summer, years before she came to meet her stuffy Tory MP husband, who she lived with now. And, uh, you know, she lives in this world of stuffed shirts and in a way she caters to them. She's buying flowers for a summer party that she's going to make later that evening. And the great and the good of Westminster are going to come. And in many ways, she is the embodiment of staid conservatism with both a large and a small C. The thing that's remarkable about Wolf, who was, of course, politically very different and also very different in her lifestyle because she was, you know, a bohemian, part of a circle of artists and writers, not of establishment politicians. But she gives this middle-aged Tory and his wife the most startling and sort of beautiful in a life. And you have these moments where all the losses of youth turn into a kind of gain because it's only at the moment that she sees she's losing the world that she loves, that she's really able to fall in love with it. And there's this moment where she's literally just pushing chairs together, I suppose, for the party that evening, that she realizes with a start how much she loves life and how privileged she feels to have been able to walk the earth. And for me, the moment is unbelievably moving because it's unsentimental. You know, it's not how life changes at that point and she sort of ditches the stuffed shirt husband and you know which would be the modern version of that that would be the modern version of that and you'd say good for you and there's a novel to be written there but it's not her novel her novel is about realizing that even within the sad constrictions of her life there is a possibility for joy and for wonder wonder at the life that is right there in front of her now, another idea I found really interesting, and this is, I think, although you put it at a different point, I'm, if I remember correctly in the book, it's about the importance of rebelling. And in a sense, to become yourself, you have to rebel against the version that your parents and your teachers wanted you to be. And you use Never Let You Go by Ishiguru. For people who haven't read the book, these are clones who have been raised to be used for their organs. And amazingly enough, as they begin to realise what they're here for, they sort of participate in it. They don't actually rebel against it. And, you know, you ask the question, why don't they rebel? And you say, to rebel against the existing order, a person must be able to locate themselves in a history that precedes them and a future that will survive them. Now, why do we need to have a good sense of history and a good sense of the future to rebel? Because I think quite a lot of my and our listeners probably have a deep-seated need to rebel, yeah. but actually a great sense of conservatism as well, because actually, you know, the world is sort of okay, but it's not. So why do we need the sense of the past and the sense of the future? Well, you make a really important point when you say that about their conservatism that sort of coexists uneasily with the impulse to rebel. That's in all of us. And I think the conservatism means that one of the forces, one of the key forces that we're rebelling against when we rebel is ourselves. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing you really, you know, you think that what you're scared of is your boss or your parents or your friends, but actually, or your partner or your partner. But, you know, more often than not, I think it's us that we're really scared of upending and scaring. And the conservatism really is about that entrenched way of doing things. The sense that this is how life is lived. These are the beliefs that you're supposed to have. This is how you're supposed to feel about yourself, about other people. It's what's been transmitted to you both consciously and unconsciously by all the important figures in your life 
from your parents to your teachers and your friends and your colleagues and so on. And of course, your partner and perhaps your children. But by the time you've accumulated these layers of habit and tradition in yourself, it's quite a large emotional effort to then challenge them, to imagine that life could be lived another way, that you might want to try something new. So rebellion becomes meaningful and becomes possible when you rub up against a kind of dissatisfaction or frustration or weariness with the way things are, not just in the world, but in yourself. Which is, in a sense, what took you into analysis, wasn't it? Exactly. Yeah, that's right. I think that's exactly it, because I had decided in a way that still feels quite affirmative in some ways, what I loved. You know, I loved imaginative life. I loved literature. That was going to be my life. But I think something in me felt that I'd sort of attached myself to this, that I'd become a bit of a security blanket to go back to peanuts and line. Uh, it all roads lead back to peanuts. They do. They do for me, I'm afraid. You'll always end up there by one route or another. Um, but uh, I think that going to analysis was my way of saying, well, what if another way of doing things were possible and you just haven't thought about it? But you needed to have a good sense of the past. Yeah. What do you mean by having a good sense of the past? A sense of how my past self and past generations, my parents, my grandparents, lived in me, what had been transmitted to me and what I had done with all that stuff, how I'd taken it into my own version of how to live a life. All of that, I think I needed to put in question. In a sense, you have to really know what you're rebelling against rather yeah. than the famous quote from, what's the film? The Wild Ones. The Wild Ones, you know, what are you rebelling against? What have you got? Yeah. You know, it's a funny line, but actually you need to be very specific about what you're rebelling against, don't yeah, you? That's right. Because I think if it isn't, it just becomes a kind of nihilism. And of course, The Wild Ones is a kind of cautionary movie about delinquency. Delinquency really is just a kind of nihilistic rebellion, which doesn't know what it wants. And we need enough future and sort of hope that the world can be different, don't we? Exactly. You need a future to invest in. And that's why one of the sort of motifs or themes that keeps coming back through the book, which surprised me really, it emerged in the writing of it, was the fear for the planet, our fear for the planet. Because if we don't have a sense, if subsequent generations don't have a sense that they have a future worth having, then they too will have nothing meaningful to rebel against. And if you don't have that, then again, you have nihilism. I think one of the wonders of great literature is one of the subjects that it's examined in great detail is marriage. Because in popular culture, marriage is either sentimental or everybody's terribly cynical about it. And here's another one of your quotes that I'd like to look at. It's the gap between illusion and reality that can enrich a marriage. Wow. I'm going to give it again. The gap between illusion and reality can enrich a marriage. So it helps unpick this idea. We actually go into all our human relationships, I think, with illusions. That is, we bring our assumptions to how we see other people. We see them through the filters of our own needs, our own wishes, our own fantasies. And as we get to know somebody, those illusions, they're not exactly chipped away necessarily. We don't ever, I think, find the absolute bare bones reality of someone else. There's always something about the other person that you don't know, however well you know them. I think the same about ourselves as well. Of course. Yeah, that's right. And also, there's always a bit of illusion, I think, that conditions your relationship. Not only are the people we know best not an exception, in many ways, they are the people we have the deepest and most powerful illusions about. It's very hard to lose your illusions about your parents, for example. And I think that marriages go sour when our illusions about the other person are brutally stripped away. And I think that that's something that we can do to one another in couples. We can start to go from seeing the other person through the subjective lens that we've imposed on them in a way. We've imagined that they are this sort of brave. Or the answer to all our prayers. Right, right, right. We've decided for them 
that they're going to be the brave and beautiful hero of our story. And then when... Who's going to save us, by the way, as well, as well as being brave and beautiful. Yes, that's right. Which I think is a sort of very deep-rooted childhood fantasy. And it is in a lot of novels as well, isn't it? The idea that the other will save us is possibly one of the archetypal stories, isn't it? Definitely. And it's in almost every fairy tale as well. There has to be a rescuer figure. And that's, I think, absolutely captivating. You know, Freud has this idea of the family romance. He believes that every child at some point develops the fantasy that their real family is Maharaj is in India or whatever. I, I will often wondered, beyond the fact that I look so incredibly like my father, I just can't imagine how I was born into this family. It just sort of makes no sense to me whatsoever. So I think it is very much a universal dream, this one. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So there's no getting away from illusion. You know, we can't just see reality or the reality of another person boldly. But we, I think, will veer in the course of a marriage from seeing them through this rather distorting lens to seeing them with a sort of brutal, objective coldness. And then we start complaining about them. And this is something that you will be familiar with in the consulting room. Yeah. I mean, people arrive in my consulting room with a long list of what the other person can do differently and an incredibly short one of what they can do differently, yeah. which is probably normally I could give up is the only thing that they've yeah. got on their list. It's quite extraordinary. It is extraordinary. I think it is maybe the great human blind spot that it is much easier to diagnose the failings and the shortcomings of somebody else than of ourselves. And in a sense, this is the message of your book, is that by reading, we go deep and see the world through the eyes of another character. And that actually makes us a little bit more generous to other people, a little bit more curious about other people. Yeah, and I think generosity is a nice word there, because that kind of empathetic relationship to other characters that literature can cultivate in us. What I like about it is that it's not just about recognition in that sense that we sometimes call relatability. I understand the wish for relatability, and often people complain about novels that there weren't enough relatable characters or they couldn't relate to the central character. And I think that it is important to be able to recognize aspects of oneself, but I think it's also important to be open enough to characters in a way that allows us to see aspects of ourselves that we hadn't previously recognized, to see things that we didn't yet know about ourselves, because that, I think, loosens the grip on us of our own self-definition. You know, I think we're self and hamstrung by the notion I am like this. I think of myself as the kind of person who, and we like to think that this sort of gives us a passport through the world, knowing that we're a bit like this. And to some extent it can, but if it becomes too rigid and too settled for too long, it becomes the opposite. It becomes a kind of constriction that stops us from seeing our broader possibilities. This is another quote from you, an inexhaustible mystery to ourselves and to everybody else. Yeah. You know, I will see people in psychoanalysis anywhere between one and five times a week. And for many years, I assume. For many years, yeah, that's right. And when I tell people that I do see people four years for five times a week, one of the inevitable responses that you get is, but what do people have to talk about themselves for that long? Every day, how is it possible? And all I can honestly say to them is, if you don't try it, I can't really communicate why it doesn't almost ever get boring or dry up. Because what psychoanalysis does is it opens up a curiosity about yourself on a kind of day by day, moment to moment level, which means, if you like, that you're always a kind of curious object of observation and commentary and feeling and response. And you're working with your unconscious, which is, by very definition, the bits of yourself that you don't know. And sometimes the answers are in the unconscious rather than the conscious. Yeah, that's right. I mean, both parties in psychotherapy are working with their unconscious. So if you're having psychotherapy, 
hopefully you loosen up in your speech and your associations enough to be able at a certain point to surprise yourself, to hear yourself saying something that you didn't expect to say, to come up with an insight about yourself that was there all along, but you hadn't had the time and the patience to really enter into. And as an analyst, what you're always trying to do is not try too hard in listening. What that means is that instead of listening for a specific content, which you then sort of unpick and explain, which I think people can, after a certain point, find a bit wearying and patronizing, you just pick up the things that really strike you in what the other person said. The emotionally hot moments. Yeah. I'm not a psychoanalyst, but um, there are times when people say something that has a certain sort of energy to it. Yeah. And those are always the most interesting things. Almost like the words are more alive than the rest of the words in the room. That's right. The metaphor of cold and heat is perfect, I think, you know, because it's very helpful. I think everyone who trains in our field finds the word hot very useful because intuitively, it, you don't need to be in a consultant room to understand what it means for an interaction to suddenly become hot, to suddenly become charged with energy. So in a moment, we're going to look at a case and we're going to see what is charged and hot in it and how we can help this person. The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. Please follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, and visit our website, andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast, where you can join our supporters club and unlock bonus material and other benefits. One of the advantages of becoming a supporter of The Meaningful Life is you get a chance to write in with a question. At higher levels, there are even more benefits. Look on my website for more details. So here's a letter that I've been written into. Two years ago, I discovered my husband had been unfaithful, and I do believe it is emotional murder to the betrayed, almost as intense as losing a child. I feel books and podcasts just go right into self-soothing, and when you're in the flight-or-fight mentality and you lose all sense of the world around you, being objective is a real challenge. My husband and I went to counselling. I was devastated beyond my wildest dreams and felt like couple counsellors take your broken state and want to dig up your childhood instead of dealing first with the trauma of infidelity. I've had extremely strong reactions because my husband won't put himself in my shoes. The rejection has been beyond devastating and has kept me from any sort of empowerment I could attain for myself. Fast forward to today, he moved out, decided the relationship didn't serve him well, and is completely avoiding any real work. I've juggled our four children, mostly as well as doing everything and anything to move forward. Unfortunately, I feel like the one who betrayed the relationship doesn't really seek out the help. I did feel like, and my spouse confirms, that he did have a great sex life. However, his ability to connect emotionally was very hard in general. Could you speak more on this topic? Well, where to start? I think, first of all, just to offer a little empathy in the face of such visceral distress. I think that's what immediately strikes me about this communication, how there's a kind of uncensored, candid sense of rawness. confusion, rawness, absolutely, and vulnerability. And I really appreciate the willingness to not hold back on the language, not to say, you know, an emotional blow, but to say emotional murder, because I think that conveys what it feels like. So we shouldn't have that anxiety about exaggerating or sounding overly dramatic. I think that if we're interested not in an objective judgment of what the act of infidelity is from an external perspective, but what it feels like from the inside, then that feels absolutely like, you know, the right phrase to use. And I think the second thing that I wanted to pick up was the emphasis, which I think is really telling, that, you know, this person doesn't speak about her jealousy of the other woman. It must be there, but that's not where her focus is. The focus is on her husband's unwillingness to acknowledge what she's feeling. And that, I think, is not only exacerbating the wound, in a certain way, it is the wound. 
And my suspicion is that he wasn't noticing her or acknowledging her long before the infidelity happened. Quite. And so really what the infidelity, I think, has done is it's thrown something really painful into relief. It's made it impossible to ignore, made it gaping and visible as a wound, the sense that she isn't seen because he's now done something unarguably, if you like, wounding and hurtful. And still, he's not seeing her. And I can see why she feels so scandalized. It's as though she's saying, I can understand why you didn't see me when we were just plodding along. But then you go and do something which hurts and distresses me in the way that is so obviously visible to anybody and audible to anybody. And still, you don't really acknowledge me. You don't see who or what I am. And in fact, it's worse than that. He's dismissing her in every sense of the word. He's dismissing her feelings and he's dismissed her out of his life. Yeah. This is incredibly difficult, I think, because we might feel tempted, might we, to sort of give her a kind of empowerment advice. You know, if that's how he is, if he has such little regard for your feelings, such little love for you, then you're well rid of him. Go off and... We can hear the cliches. Go out that door. You're not yeah, wanted right. here anymore. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I Take will survive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that this correspondent is in the very first stage of grief and she needs to be allowed to grieve the marriage that she had hoped for, that she invested so much in. They've got four children together. Mm. So her entire world was built on this couple. And this couple has been dissolved with what at least she experiences as a kind of breathtaking casualness. So not just the localized betrayal of an infidelity, but a betrayal of their entire world together. Yeah, all her adult life effectively. Yeah. And the trouble is that the husband doesn't acknowledge it, which means that it's it's a wound that she can't even begin to start healing. And I think what she says about the couple's counsellors... Being one, I have to confess, if you've got both people in the room, you've got to listen to both of them. And that is really difficult because you've got to listen to somebody who says things that shame the other person. And it, you don't really want to be party to somebody being shamed, but they've actually got to be heard as well. So how do you hear both people? It can be difficult. Yeah, that is incredibly difficult. And I think that has got to be one of the stages here as well. I was interested that she said about the couple's counsellors that they wanted to sort of leap into childhoods. I think that's something that all therapists want to do because it could be, and please don't get angry with me, but one of the reasons that you're with somebody who can't see you is because your experience up to now has been that your parents didn't see you. So it might go deeper than just that. So although it might seem as something very uncaring, to say, well, you know, forget about that. Let's talk about your childhood. It is an attempt to try and help. It's probably an attempt that's being done too soon, but they're doing it not because they've got, you know, this tick list, like we must talk about your childhood. They're hoping it's going to be something that's going to be helpful for you. And I think the message I would give to everybody is you need to give your therapist feedback. And if you tell them that actually talking about my childhood isn't helpful for me, I'm, you know, most good therapists will listen. They're perfectly happy to have feedback. You know, I don't want to talk about my childhood. I feel I'm not being heard. And, you know, I don't want to talk about that. I need to talk about this. Time after time, people feel that once you walk through our doors, you've got to follow our agenda. And you don't. It's perfectly possible to have a discussion and find a different way. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's right. And particularly when what somebody is bringing is both traumatic and urgent. You know, mm. it's, it's not something they're carrying from way back. I mean, it might be, of course, but as they experience, it is happening to them right now and it's quite unbearable. And of course, here it's being made more unbearable by the fact that nobody wants to see it. That in some way, these couples counsellors that she's tried to go to, she feels like they're repeating the injury of her husband, which is not to see where she is now and what's happening to her. So I think that that 
needs acknowledging. And then part of the grieving process is that she's going to have to try to listen to this man's discontent, you know, whatever it was. But if he's gone, why bother listening to his discontent? Yeah. Because you're just going to be torturing yourself. I mean, I think it's actually useful to think about, you know, if I had my time over again, I might do differently. I think that's entirely beneficial to think, what can I learn from it? But why he was discontent, it's pretty pointless to listen to that. And because whatever reason he was discontent, it will not be good enough to, and I'm going to use inverted commas, excuse what he did, which is sometimes when somebody's dealing with infidelity and they're asked to imagine what their partner did, Mm -hmm. from their point of view, it sounds like making excuses for them. Sometimes it's useful to think about what I could learn and what I would do differently next time. So that's about you. If he's not available for this, he's not available. I'm afraid I'm going to go back to simple things we were told as children, but you can take a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. And you can take your partner to couples therapy, but you can't actually make them use it. Yeah. So the question is, how do you come to terms with the fact that he's not coming back and there isn't going to be a therapy, there isn't going to be a reckoning of the couple with each other. That's part of the grieving process, isn't it? I mean, I think she can get help with her grief and I think she can get help. I think, you know, rebelling against what didn't work in the marriage and finding a future that is going to work. It's that sort of what we were saying about the rebellion at midlife and at teenage years. You know, she needs to rebel against the picture of the marriage that has been painted and think about what kind of relationships she does want in the future and how she's going to get there. Yes. It sounds to me like she's carried the weight of this marriage. She is the one who's made the substantial emotional investment in it. And you have to wonder, well, how long has this man she's been married to really disburdened himself of that emotional weight, you know, and sort of let her carry it all? It feels a bit like that's still happening to her. That's what animates the letter. Well, I hope that we've spoken more on this topic for you. And thank you for sharing your experiences. So, We've invited you on this program to think about what makes life meaningful. So we're going to turn the attention to you as our witness on this. What makes your life meaningful? Intimacy, I think. That would be my spontaneous first item on the list. And what do you mean by intimacy? Because I think you mean something different from what lots of people mean from intimacy. This is because I've read your book, because you say that real intimacy is not just closeness, but actually recognising that the other person is an individual and separate as well. It has a sort of a second layer to it than just the closeness. Am am I putting words into your mouth or am I getting it right? you're getting it exactly right, that there is a kind of lovely paradox about intimacy which is that people, I think, often make the mistake of thinking that intimacy is the breaking down of distance and mystery in a relationship. And it can lead to a kind of confusion of intimacy with tiredness or fed upness. Or tell me more about yourself. You're holding back. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Whereas if you think of the sort of the basic unknowability that we were talking about before of another person as something that can enrich a relationship rather than impoverish it, then you arrive at a quite different sense of intimacy, an intimacy that embraces the inexhaustibility of another person, their their capacity to always surprise you. And that can be in some banal detail about not knowing that, I don't know, they loved lychees. And it can be something much bigger and more surprising. Perhaps it comes out in the way in which they respond to a crisis in their own life or in your life. Or perhaps as they come to another life stage, they want different things. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And again, intimacy doesn't involve saying to the other person, but I know who you are. So if you want to change, you're becoming somebody different. I think intimacy involves an openness to the ways in which the other person 
will want to change and which you will want to change. I'm thinking of a sort of like a house with many rooms. You suddenly discover there's another room or a right. secret panel, which is sort of in the Enid Blyton books I read as a child, you know, a secret panel was terribly exciting, but actually yeah. it can also be quite frightening too. Yes, of course. Yeah. It is quite frightening because the terms of a relationship are upended. And these moments of change and possibly crisis are often the moments that a marriage collapses. But where the crisis is, I think the opportunity is as well. It can be a moment where the bond goes deeper. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you very much. This is the point where most people will be ending the conversation. But if you're one of our supporters, you'll get a chance to hear as we reflect on this interview. And you'll also discover the three things that Josh knows to be true. You've been listening to The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. You can follow Andrew on Twitter, like him on Facebook, and please leave a review wherever you consume your podcasts. Making, editing, and distributing The Meaningful Life comes with substantial costs, and we'd like to ask for your help. Visit our website, andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast, where you can join our supporters club and unlock bonus material for every program, send in a letter to be discussed by Andrew and his guests, and join a community of other people seeking to make their life meaningful. At the gold level, you get even more benefits. Production of The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall is by Michael Dooney. Social media by Madeleine Healy. Sound engineering and theme tune by Sebastian de la Luz Mendoza. And I'm Susie Colick. Please tell your friends and spread the word. Thank you.